So now um, I'm going to do the scripture reading. So if we could all stand up. Um, We are reading from Matthew 19, verses 16 through 26. Um, I'm going to, at the end of it, I'm going to say this is the word of the Lord. If you could respond by saying, thanks be to God. I think it should come up if you don't know if you're quiet. Um, And behold, a man came to him saying, teacher, what, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, murder. <laughs> you, shall not steal. you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witnesses, honor your father and mother, and you shall not love your neighbor as yourself, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept, why do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel, camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, astonished saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. This is the word of the Lord. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. We're going to talk about money today and uh, your finances, because I know you all woke up this morning and you thought, I would love it if a preacher would tell me what to do with my money. Um, No, we're not. I'm not going to tell you what to do with your money, but we're going to let the word of God teach us um, because it actually has a lot to say about our finances. Actually, Jesus taught more about money, more about finances than he did about faith and prayer combined. And there's a good reason for it. Money actually uh, is a, can be a dangerous thing. And hopefully you picked up on that in the story we just heard read. We have this young man that's being given this incredible invitation. Come join my disciples. Come come be a part of my disciples. This is what the the invitation was. And he walked away. This is a man who was looking for eternal life, right? This is a churchgoer. This is is somebody who who goes to the Bible studies. This This is a person. This is not just a random person on the street. He came to Jesus. And at the end, he walked away. And the reason is because his money had his heart. Jesus says in verse 23, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. And he chooses his money. But there's another story in the Bible which we're not going to be looking at today. Maybe you're familiar with it. A man named Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man. (laughs) This is Zacchaeus. He, He... was also a very wealthy man and Zacchaeus given these two options either money or Jesus chose Jesus and and so I just want to say that from the outset that every person isn't going to choose their money over Jesus there's a miracle that can happen in the hearts of all of us to help us to see that he's better It happened for Zacchaeus. He gave away half his wealth. He paid back everyone that he'd ever wronged four times what he owed him. And he followed Jesus. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to your house. And so my prayer this week, leading up to this week, for you, for me, has been that money would be no idol to us that that the grip of money would be loosened off of our hearts and so that's what i'm expecting god to do today um, in many of your lives today because of this word from matthew 19 so pray with me we have a lot to cover i want to jump right in father in heaven oh if we could only see If we could only see how great you are, 
how mighty you are, how good you are, how much better you are than everything this world has to offer. But Father, you know the battle. You know that we live under this shadow. You know the deception that has gripped us. And so, God, we cry out to you today. I beg you to do miracles in this room, to open up eyes in this room, not just of those who do not yet know you, but those who know you, and money is getting a grip. And that's probably all of us. And so, God, we need miracles. We need lots of them. And I am so glad to know that you are more than willing to perform them. And so it's with that hope that we ask this and expect this. In Jesus' name, amen. So I've got a really simple outline for us today, three points. Um, The first is salvation is a miracle. We've got to establish this first. It's a big part of this story. If you'll look with me at Matthew 19 and verses 23 through 26. It says, And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. Impossible. But with God, All things are possible. The first thing that we need to see is that in order for a rich person or any person to enter the kingdom of heaven, a miracle must take place. With man, it is impossible. Maybe you have been around the church for a while and you've heard somebody say, oh, a camel through the eye of a needle, that has to do with a low gate in Jerusalem, and camels had to get down on their knees and walk through. First of all, camels do not walk on their knees, and that is not impossible. This is Jesus making a point. Camels can't go through the eye of a needle. They do not fit. They're very big animals, and the eyes of needles are very small. It's impossible. Which is why the disciples respond the way that they do. Who then can be saved? You see, what Jesus doesn't reply to that is, who then can be saved? Well, the poor, they can be saved. He doesn't reply to that, well, the humble, they can be saved. He doesn't say, well, those who get on their knees and walk through the gate, those can be saved. He says, with man, this is impossible. Impossible. Why? Because man is sinful through and through. We are sinful through and through. Romans chapter 3 tells us that no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. No one does good. Not even one. Not even one. No one seeks for God. Nobody. Until God seeks them. This young man, he comes to Jesus, and he has been working hard, trying hard. He comes to Jesus and he thinks, if there's something I'm missing, I better know it. What's the one thing I need to do? What, what else do I need to do? He thinks that he can accumulate good deeds that will outweigh his bad. 
And many people think that this is how a person gets into heaven, that they'll stand before God on judgment day, that their good deeds will be placed on one side of a scale and their bad deeds will be placed on another side of a scale. And if their good deeds weigh more than their bad deeds, then God will say, good job, you can come in. But friend, no one will get into heaven that way. No one. There is only one way that anyone will get into heaven, and that is if a miracle takes place. And if your heart is transformed, and you suddenly see Jesus. You know, what never happened for this poor young man, I say poor young man, the, the Bible says rich, I say this poor young man, poor young man, he looked Jesus, the most valuable being in the universe, in the face, was given the opportunity to know him, to follow him, to be with him, to spend eternity with him. And he chose his bank account. Why? Because he couldn't see. You see, faith in its most simple definition it's believing right salvation comes by believing in jesus but but what does that look like in the bible it looks like seeing him for who he is it looks like seeing him in his beauty in his worth in his grandeur it looks like seeing that he is worth more than everything this is the parable of the treasure hidden in a field the person sees that the treasure of Jesus is worth more than everything I have. That's faith. Faith is seeing that he is valuable. In Acts 26, Paul tells this story about Jesus commissioning him. And Jesus tells Paul, I am sending you to open their eyes eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of satan to god unless god opens eyes you will not turn from the power of darkness to light salvation is a miracle every single time and so now that i have established that let me just say this to loosen your grip uh, from money and for money to loosen its grip from you is also a miracle it's a miracle when it happens it's impossible apart from god but god can do it he wants to do it he will do it and so that's what we're praying for today i just wanted to start there so that as we consider money we can realize this is impossible in my own power, in my own flesh, with my own faculties. I cannot get free from the delusion of money being what I really need. So that's my first point. Salvation is a miracle. My second point is this. Money is a menace. Salvation is a miracle. Money is a menace. Now I've got to give you a little disclaimer here. Money in and of itself isn't actually bad. But, but because of our fallen hearts, because of our fallen state, money's a menace. Because of who we are, because we tend to elevate money as an idol and treat it as though, as though it could save us. We, we treat money like a functional savior, money's a menace. And because of that, because of our tendency to do that, we need to handle with care. We need to be aware of its power. There is nothing as deceptive as wealth. Nothing. Because any other sin that you commit when you're in the middle of it, you know it. Right? If you're, if you're having an affair, if you're committing adultery, you know it. You're not sitting there going, is this my wife or not? But if money's got a grip on your heart, you probably just think that you're living life better than, than the people around you. You probably just think that you've made better choices. You probably just think you're wiser. 
right? You probably just think you've got it together. The people around you need to get it together. Money is very deceptive, and I think this is what happened to this young man. It says in verses 21 and 22. Look at those with me. If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful. Why? For he had great possessions. He went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Again, this young man heard the greatest invitation that can be heard with human ears. He heard Jesus say to him, come, follow me. And he walked away. He walked away. Jesus has already said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, that no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot. And what this young man wanted was to serve God and money. He wanted to, he wanted to have all of the wealth, all of the power, all of the prestige, all of the control that money gave him. And he wanted to add Jesus on top. He came to Jesus. He wanted Jesus. He just wanted Jesus plus his own way. That's what many of you who are here want. In a room with this many people, there are many in this room. That's what you want. You want life your way. You want to do it your way. Still enjoy your sin. You want to still enjoy control. But you want to add Jesus on top. And you cannot. I don't say that condemning you, but out of love, you cannot. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot be Lord of your life and Jesus. Money will cause us to think lies about ourselves. We'll think that we're better than others. We'll think that that we have a lot more control than we do. We'll think that the future is set. But the Bible says to tell the rich not to put their hope in the uncertainty of riches, but on God. Money's a menace because of its ability to blind us. Um, money has a blinding and binding power in our lives. And so Jesus says it's only with difficulty that a rich person can enter the kingdom of heaven. Wealth more than any other idol known to man has the power, and it is a real power, to offer you influence and identity and security. And these are things that only God wants to give us. But money has a blinding effect. And so we've got to be aware of it so that we can be on guard. And money has a binding effect. Money will cause you to serve it. Once you get to a certain um, level of living economically, it is very hard to give that up. And you will work very, very hard to keep that level of living. And you will cling to that. And you'll do everything you can to keep that. You will make sacrifices in other areas so that you can have that level of living. And so this causes people to, to become workaholics. Where they're married to their, to their work. Because, because in order to keep what is mine, what I've grown so accustomed to having... I would rather sacrifice the rest of my life than to sacrifice what I've got, my possessions, and my lifestyle. Money has a binding effect on us. And many of us are in its chains. So the question, when we think about our money, we cannot think about it as, 
as if it is just this option to maybe I'll serve money. Maybe I'll live for my career. Maybe I'll live for my status. Maybe I'll live for my retirement. We need to recognize that when we face our finances head on, there's a fork in the road. Every single time, we must choose Jesus or we must choose our money. We cannot serve both. You cannot serve God and money. And, and, and lest you think that this is a message only for those who have much money. No, it's just the opposite. You know, this is a message for every single heart. Do you know that if, if we feel like we need more money, we are in danger of ruining our lives? You know that the Bible says that to desire money is to plunge yourself into ruin and destruction? Let's look at that together. Because I didn't make that up. That's 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6, verses 8 through 11, says this. Read it together. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. For those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Did anybody catch that warning? Those who desire to be rich? It doesn't say those who are rich. It says those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare. You know what a snare is? It's a, it's a trap to catch an animal. You're just hopping along. You know, little bunny rabbit. And you stick your foot in that snare, and the next thing you know, you're hanging upside down and can't do anything. The desire for more money is a snare. It will plunge you. Plunge you. I mean, listen to those words. Plunge people into ruin and destruction. Do you, this is the holy word of God. Do you recognize how powerful of a warning that is? Money is so dangerous, it's, it's a menace, not because money in and of itself is evil. If money in and of itself were evil, then we shouldn't give any to anybody, right? Money in and of itself has power to be used as a tool for good. So don't misunderstand me. But it has power, great power, to deceive us into thinking that we really love Jesus when we've really just tried to add Jesus to our lives. But we really serve money. It's so deceptive. That's why Jesus warns us in Luke 12, 15. Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. Take care and be on your guard you know, he doesn't say that about other sins. Because other sins are not as deceptive as this. He says, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. Coveting. It's the sin of wanting what God hasn't given you. I'm thinking that if I just had that, then I'd be happy. If I just had a little bit more. If I had what God hasn't given me. In other words, covetousness is idolatry. It's the desire that God be someone that he isn't. Covetousness is so deadly and so deceptive. So money is a menace 
because the craving for more money is a craving for a different God and it will plunge you into ruin and destruction. If you're sitting there thinking, I'm in trouble, I've got a craving for more money. I'm going to help you. I want to help you. I want, we, listen, you are not alone. You are not alone. This is a fight. This is a serious, ongoing, lifelong battle. And I want to give you some help. It brings me to my final point. Salvation is a miracle, money is a menace, and fighting is a must. Fighting is a must. Maybe you caught it there at the end of that passage in 1 Timothy 6. He says, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things. You cannot take this sitting down. There's action required. Um, the first thing I want to say before I give you, I'm going to give you two weapons in this fight that you can go home with. Before we get to that, I want to just say this. You should not be asking yourself the question, is money a struggle for me in my heart? You should be asking yourself the question, in what ways and, in, and to what degree has this got a grip on my heart? That's how powerful this is. Lest you sit there and think, who do I need to share this message with? <laughs> this is a power that we are all affected by. In a message that I heard um, Tim Keller preach on the Proverbs, he said that um, people tend to treat money as a functional savior in two primary ways. And I thought this was really helpful. He said they either treat money as a functional savior by allowing money and wealth to give them significance. That's one way. Or by allowing money and wealth to give them security. That's the other way. And I'll, and I'll explain. So so that you can know one of these is you and me. This is us. Maybe both. But if you tend to treat money as a functional savior to give you significance, then, then you probably like to upgrade, right? Because um, having the better car, the better house, or the better suit or whatever, that gives you some status, that gives you it makes you feel, you know, more respected. Maybe the, the nicer watch or the, the next iPhone or the, or the whatever. But you're not afraid to spend it. Because it gives you some significance. It gives you a feeling when you're hanging out with other people that, you know, have money. It feels good. And that's money giving you some sense of significance. And you, you might struggle. You look at somebody who's, who's not got a lot. They're wearing some tattered clothes or driving a rusty car and you think, wow, what, what, have, what are they doing wrong in life? Or you look at money as a functional savior to give you security. That, that's those of us who spend less and save more. We're always thinking about the future. We're always thinking about having enough to the end and we, we hoard it and we are afraid to give it away and it hurts to give it away right and it hurts to spend it because you're looking to money for security because you're looking to it to to give you a sense of control and maybe if you're if this is you maybe you struggle with fear or anxiety and and money helps you to not feel so anxious about things so one of these two ways we're all tempted or maybe both so the question before we get to our weapons is not, am I somebody who struggles with the power of money, but how do I struggle with the power of money and to what degree? So now that we've established we are all struggling with this, um, let's look at a couple of weapons for you to fight with. Weapon number one is thanksgiving. Weapon number one is thanksgiving. Why is being thankful a weapon against the power of money? The reason is because 
when we are thankful to God for everything, every day, every single blessing, every meal, every shirt we put on, every pair of shoes we wear, when we are thankful that our car cranked and that we were able to get to work and we're thankful that we have work, what happens? Contentment begins to grow in us. Because gratitude reminds us of why we have anything. It points us back to the giver. It reminds us that we are not self-made men and women. We do not have anything that we have because of our good. If you have talents and abilities and wisdom and the, uh, to make money, to, to, to have a good job, praise God. You didn't do that. He gave you that gift. So, so gratitude, it writes your perspective. I like to think of gratitude as windshield wipers on the windshield of my life. Because so many days I wake up and I start feeling discontent. I feel like I don't like the weather today. I, I don't like what I have to do on my calendar today. I don't like how I slept last night. I didn't get enough breakfast. You know what? You know. And what happens is you've got the wrong perspective. And I need a perspective shift. I need all that grime and dirt that's causing me, that's blinding me to the blessings in my life that God has given me in abundance. I can't see it. And so I need some Thanksgiving windshield wipers to wipe that grime off of my windshield. It's silly, but you'll remember it now. It says in uh, Hebrews 13, 5, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is how you can be, this is how you can be content. Give thanks to God that he will never leave you. That he is with you every single day, every single moment. Do you realize what a thing that is to be thankful for? He will never leave you or forsake you. So we fight. You, you may not realize what a powerful weapon this is. Pick it up this week. It's Thanksgiving week. You have an excuse. Pick this weapon up. Use it more than you ever have. See what happens to your perspective. See what happens to your joy. See what happens to your desire for more. It's going to lessen when you recognize how blessed you are. You have food and clothing. With those, you can be content. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Some of you have been asking the question, what is God's will for my life? Give thanks in all circumstances. That's God's will for your life and mine. So take this week of Thanksgiving. Take advantage of it. Maybe you've never cared about Thanksgiving. Well, you know what? For God's sake, care about it this week. For your relationship with Him, go bigger this week than you ever have. And do it the right way. Be thankful to the one who's actually given you everything. Second weapon in this fight this is a big one. Fight with generosity. You can fight with thanksgiving and you can fight with generosity. Look at what Jesus says to this young man who money's got a grip on his life. Jesus says to him, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. What does giving do? When we give, when we give with right motives, it transfers our thinking and our focus from the earthly things to heaven. It, it, it changes where we are valuing things. If we keep it and hoard it, what are, we, what are we valuing? What are we focusing on here, now, earth? If we give it away, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
you know, there's a principle that your heart will actually follow your finances. And so if you give and give and give to yourself or you give and give and give to whatever, your heart's going to follow it. Fill in the blank. But if you give to be a blessing, if you give to see the kingdom advanced, then your heart will follow your giving. Generosity is a powerful weapon against the binding effects of money. Not to mention the fact that when we give, we actually realize that we're, it's better, it's happier, it's more blessed to give than to receive. That is the happier life. That is the more blessed life. You know, when we're clinging to our money, when we're holding on to it, and, and what we don't realize is that we are enslaved. We are in bondage to that money. And when we give it, there's freedom. There's freedom to give because it is truly more blessed to give than to receive. It says in Proverbs eleven twenty four, one gives freely, yet grows all the richer. That is not, that is not a proverb to say, if you want to get more money, give your money away. If that is why you give your money away, you are still in bondage to money. You're not free. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer in all the ways that matter. You grow all the richer in joy, in peace. You grow richer in freedom. You grow richer in your love of God and people. In all the ways that matter, you grow richer. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. We think we're saving our lives by hoarding our money, and yet we're losing our lives in the process. So let go and give it away. The amount that God asks of you, and my, my exhortation on this, if you're wondering how much, how much, how much, your heart is still in bondage at that point. If, if, if that's what gives you the anxiety, your heart is not free yet. And so I would just encourage you, just start. Just start giving. If you don't know where to start, here's one idea. Start with a tithe. The Bible always talks about 10% given to the Lord. Start there. If, you're not, if you, you don't feel like you can get there yet, then start wherever you can, but don't stop. And I just want to encourage you with this. You, this is not a one-time decision. You can't walk out of here and be like, you know what, I'm going to give today. And you go and you give some money to somebody or whatever, and then it's a done deal. No, no, no. Money's not going anywhere, and the power of it and its blinding and binding effects on you are not going anywhere. This is a lifelong battle. When I, when I talk about giving you these weapons of thanksgiving and generosity, you gotta, you got to pick these things up and wield them all your life long until you die. You cannot give up this fight or money will... What does Jesus say in Matthew earlier? We read uh, months ago the story about how um, the... the word of God is like a seed that goes into hearts. Remember, there's shallow soil, rocky soil, and, and then there's the, um, the soil that is got thorns and thistles in it. Remember this? And it chokes out the word gradually, slowly over time. Remember what those thorns were, those weeds were? The deceitfulness of riches, the desire for other things. And this is the thing about money. You see, you can receive the word with a glad heart, and over time, without weeding that garden, the desire for money, the deceitfulness of riches, choke out the word, and it prove you were never genuinely saved. If you walk away from Jesus in the end, like this man, so this isn't a one-time decision. This is a lifelong fight to be fought with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So if he's given you spiritual sight, if you've seen Jesus as worth more than everything, praise God, it's a miracle. He has done a miracle in your life. If he hasn't, I want to encourage you today that he wants to do a miracle. God is in the business of doing miracles. He loves to do the impossible. It's his favorite thing. If you haven't yet believed the good news, I want to I leave you with this thought. Maybe you have heard the good news about Jesus, that the, Jesus, the Son of God, came. He lived a perfect and sinless life. And why did he die on the cross? He died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins because we all have broken God's holy law sinned against, rebelled against a holy God and are guilty before him. And so Jesus died on the cross in order to pay the penalty for that guilt. And he was buried and on the third day he rose from the grave. And maybe you know that stuff and you believe that stuff intellectually, but Jesus is still not Lord of your life. And I want to leave you with this thought. You know, at the end of the day, maybe the, the challenge for you is what it was for me. When I was in college, I was wrestling with these things for a year. I wrestled with this gospel, with this good news. And at the, at the end of that year, I recognized that for me, it all boiled down to my unwillingness to let Jesus be in control. I wanted to be in control. I wanted to at least maintain some control, hold on to some of my sins, and still have those, and I was unwilling to fall down on my knees. I was unwilling to surrender. And don't you see that's exactly what this rich young man faced? At the end of the day, Jesus gave him a command, and he was unwilling to do it, so he walked away. He was unwilling to surrender. Faith often looks like surrender. It often looks like us raising the white flag, saying, you know what, I've held on to my sin for long enough. I've held on to control for long enough. I believed this gospel intellectually. I've wanted a Savior, but I haven't wanted a Lord. And you cannot have part of Jesus. If he's going to come into your life, he's going to come in to lead. That's why the invitation is always come and follow me. Not, hey, I'd like to follow you around. That's not what Jesus wants. That's not how he comes into a life. He comes in to lead, to make you his disciple. And in order for that to happen, you need to surrender. I want to encourage you to do that this morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the miracle of salvation. Oh, Lord, thank you that even though with man this is impossible, with you it is possible. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for going to the cross, for taking our sins upon yourself and absorbing the wrath of God for our sins. Holy Spirit, thank you for breathing life back into Jesus' body in the grave. Father, thank you for sending the Son. Thank you that you have ordained that this be so, that there is a way for sinners who are dead in our trespasses and sins to be made alive together with Christ. Thank you that it is by grace that we are saved and not by works, not by doing, not by adding another good deed on top of what we're doing and having enough good deeds. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that it is not by our merit, but yours. And God, I ask for those in this room who don't yet know you, that came here and they hardened to you, soften their hearts, God. Help them to surrender. Help them not to walk away from you today. We ask it in Jesus' name, and Lord, we ask for every single one of us, 
help us to fight this powerful idol of money in our lives, whether we see it as security or significance. Help us, God, to fight. Help us to fight with thanksgiving and help us to fight with generosity. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.